What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekoWatt video. And in this one, I'm going to be showing you how to build an awesome $1,000 gaming PC build that is perfectly equipped for playing all the latest titles at 1080p high settings while achieving that crucial 60 FPS and beyond. Let's do this. I'll be splitting this video down into a few key sections. First, I'm gonna run you through all the parts I chose and why, why you should consider them or also alternatives to keep in mind, how to put a system like this together. Not a full tutorial, but we're gonna build it, see what goes wrong, see what goes right. And then we're gonna look at performance a little bit later to make sure this build actually performs as you would expect if you're spending this much money. Now let's begin, shall we, by looking at the... Oh, oh I haven't got a CPU, hang on. The CPU, the i5. 13400F. Now the processor is a great place to start because alongside the graphics card, it defines the core performance the build will deliver. Now what I mean by that is as long as you avoid bottlenecks after your CPU and GPU combo has been determined, performance isn't likely to change too much. If you've got more money to spend, these are the parts to change and upgrade. The i5-13400F though is an exceptionally good CPU in its own right. With an impressive 10 cores, 16 threads, and a boost clock speed that runs up to 4.6 gigahertz max, this chip is impressive. Plus, it's also got a manufacturer's suggested retail price of under $200, making it an exceptional value pick. So for latest pricing and availability, check out the link below. Graphics-wise, I talk about the combo. How am I gonna complete it? I've got the MSI Gaming X Trio RTX 3060. You've got a couple of options when it comes to graphics cards. The 3060 is the best bet if you're looking for NVIDIA's great DLSS and ray tracing performance, but don't sleep on the RX 6650 XT, a card that I've seen cropping up on various retail sites, Newegg, JustGPU.com, Best Buy, for under $300 recently. It's all about price to performance though, and I'll pop some graphs on your screen now comparing this to the 6650 XT, so you guys can make up your own mind. The 3060 though is still a great graphics card. This MSI cooler looks the business too, and is gonna work perfectly for the build today. Of course, having selected an Intel-based system, I do need to pick up an Intel motherboard. That's where the MSI B760 Tomahawk Wi-Fi comes in. Couple of reasons I picked this board. It's got Wi-Fi included as standard support for the latest DDR5 memory, something which should help to future-proof this system. Plus, DDR5 RAM is actually getting a lot cheaper, making it a more viable bet recently. It's also got good networking and integrated rear I.O. and decent power delivery for the CPU. Supports RAM overclocking as well, so we can push RAM speeds, but of course, the B-series chipset on Intel does not support CPU overclocking. You can learn about whether this is a good option for you or the higher-end Z790 chipset in the cards section now. RAM and SSD, pretty simple. I've picked up a one terabyte Samsung SSD 980. Read and write speeds in the region of three gigabytes a second. It's not Gen 4, but it's as fast as Gen 3 gets and is gonna be more than adequate for the build today. It's also very lightweight. RAM-wise, I've picked up a 32 gig kit. Of course, there's Vengeance RGB DDR5. James, why 32 gigabytes? 16 gigs is increasingly becoming a bottleneck. And don't forget just how powerful a combo like this can be. You could get away with 16 gigs in this build, but for an extra 50, 60 dollars, it's just not worth running the risk. And who wants a slow and sluggish PC when they're spending about a grand? Cooling-wise, I've kept it simple. This is Cooler Master's new Hyper 212 Spectrum V3. I hadn't really realized they'd done a Spectrum Spectrum V1 or 2, to be honest, but presumably they have. This is essentially another carnation of the Hyper 212 Evo, Hyper 212 RGB, sort of the same thing, but it's much better than a stock cooler, quieter, and of course keeps temperatures lower, better for overall system longevity and reliability. Case-wise, I've got the Cooler Master Masterbox 520 with the slogan of reaching new brights. Cooler Master. Come on, what are you playing at? One of their newest cases, despite the fact they've used the Masterbox 520 name quite a few times at this point. Nice case though, we've got three RGB fans at the front, a tallest removal tempered glass side panels, a tongue twister ladies and gents. I nearly failed to get that out of my mouth. Oh, I've said that. And yeah, it's good. It's a great case. There's not really anything I can complain about. Power is gonna be provided by this. Cooler Masters MWE 750 Gold. Not to be confused with this, bear with. 
this, this right here is their V750i. The box looks more flashy, more than twice as expensive. This is good for next gen graphics cards like 4070 Ti. This is good for a mid range build like this $1,000 system. I think I've covered everything. I'll also link some of my recommended peripherals down in the description below. So if you're looking for a good monitor, keyboard, mouse for this build, you can check those out. But for now, I think it is build time. The CPU is the first thing that I'm going to install. And if you take a look at the bottom of the chip just here, you'll see a little golden triangle just over here that we need to line up with the one on the socket. Now you'll be able to see there's a golden triangle just here, a uh, plastic triangle, sorry, golden on the CPU, plastic on the motherboard, which we can align up and drop the chip into place with. Add that in like so, give it a bit of a wiggle, pop the cover down, it'll flick off the plastic cover and we're all good on that front. RAM or memory is next and you'll see here there's a little notch on the RAM here. It's slightly off center, but a top dip for Corsair memory specifically. You want the side with vengeance to be pointing away from the CPU and the side with the label to be pointing towards. Pull back the clips on the second and fourth dim slots before sliding the memory in and applying a bit of pressure to both sides. The RAM is then going to seed nice and easily and a DDR5 kit like this especially some of the newer ones with lower latencies should last you quite a while. SSDs next, all we're gonna do is just take off the M.2 cover above the top PCI lane uh, using a TD tiny screwdriver and drop the drive into place. Return the cover and this will help to keep our drive nice and cool while also maintaining the aesthetic of the motherboard. Very nice, very nice indeed. The cooler is then the next part to install, sort of the final bit really before we move the motherboard assembly, that's the motherboard with all the bits on it, into the case. Now, air coolers can be a little bit cumbersome to install, but I'm pretty familiar with the 212 lineup and I'm hoping that this one is not too dissimilar in that respect. As far as installation goes, the fan comes off first, leaving the bare cooler. Then these brackets just need to pop on. These are the Intel specific ones for AMD. They're a slightly different size, but they do come included with a couple of screws going in those two holes, those two countersunk holes to hold the brackets in place. Then the Intel backplate goes in a place to flip the motherboard around, add the backplate through all these holes like so. Let me see if I can just line this up properly. Lovely stuff. Nice, nice, nice. And then a little bit of thermal paste is going to pop onto the CPU itself. So a little dab just here before the cooler itself slots into place nice and easily. Just line up all of these little screws here that are on the brackets and screw them in down into place with a screwdriver. Leave the fan off for now as I'll be adding this in later. Putting it on now is going to make screwing the motherboard in too tricky. This then is where the case comes into play. We've got that tallest side panel I talked about earlier. Pull that off nice and easy. The rear one sadly isn't, well it is tallest because you can just use your thumbs and tighten it manually but it's not got a fancy Whoa, that's like the ultimate bottle flip Intel edition. Yeah, boys, Intel inside. Great for CPUs and liquids alike. Anyway, bit weird. Case, so <laughs> this is a full size ATX case. So looking at it, yeah, all the standoffs are perfectly set up for an ATX build like this one, meaning all I need to do is slide the motherboard in a place. Lovely stuff. And that's just gonna sit in nice and easy. Few screws, three at the top, three along the middle, three down the bottom, and the motherboard's in, and the fan can go back on the cooler as well to start making things look that bit more complete. Power supply is next, and then we can finally put the graphics card in. The bit we're all the most excited about, or at least the bit I'm the most excited about. This 750 watt unit is a great value option, 80 plus gold, fully modular, ticks a lot of boxes, but of course you can go for the 650 watt unit if you want to go for a slightly cheaper overall choice. In terms of cables and wiring, you'll get all the ones you need in this little bag, and that includes a CPU, motherboard, GPU, and SATA power cable. Plug these four connectors up to the power supply on the modular interface before screwing the whole unit into the rear of the case. I'll be going for a fan down orientation to pull fresh air into the chassis and out the back of the power supply. All that then needs to happen is the cables need to plug in to the other end, so to the motherboard on the right hand side, motherboard on the top left for the CPU power, and then any SATA power cables too. Graphics card power obviously we can't plug in yet because there's no GPU, but that's what we'll be solving in just a moment. And this is it, the MSI Gaming X Trio 3060. As I mentioned earlier, you've got a choice. The 6650 XT is also a solid shout. See which one appeals most to you from like a features point of view, compare pricing in your local region, and I'll leave links for a range of different retailers and countries in the description below. Here we go though, finally time to slot this thing into place. By the looks of it, we're all good. The PCI lanes have been removed already from a previous build, so that's good. Push the PCI slot back, add the graphics card into place. Bit of a click, lovely stuff. A few screws, a power cable to keep the whole thing juiced up, and we're ready to finally boot this thing up to check out performance. But first, how good it looks in an epic Geekawatt montage. Let's do this. It's time 
Time to answer then the big question you've all been waiting for. How well does a build that costs around about $1,000 actually perform in the latest titles? Well, I put this build straight into the deep end by testing the latest Call of Duty Warzone 2.0 title first. At 1080p high settings with DLSS enabled and set to the quality preset, this build yielded nearly 110 FPS with 109 frames to be precise. This was with DLSS set to quality, a setting which if you tune down to balanced or performance will degrade image quality very slightly but yield more frame rate. Of course 1080p medium will also allow for even more FPS but the 109 figure achieved here is not only both very competitive but also very impressive. Modern Warfare 2 Remastered is a similarly written and coded game to Warzone 2 in terms of the basic architecture and that reflects itself with a similar frame rate. Slightly higher here at 116 frames per second on average but pretty similar nonetheless. 90 and 99 percentile results were strong too while all of the frame rate data was gathered using in both MSI Afterburners Reva Tuner and NVIDIA FrameView. Fortnite is next on the list at 1080p competitive settings. Here the build pulled in an impressive 265 frames per second on average with 90 and 99 percentile results in the 240 and 210 FPS region. Move through to other games like Apex Legends, another first person shooter Battle Royale and at 1080p high the build maintained a still impressive 164 FPS on average providing a smooth gaming experience great for even the highest refresh rate 1080p monitors. Overwatch 2 also stacked up well, an easier game to run, but still important nonetheless. 1080p ultra settings here delivered 194 frames per second on average. Games like Battlefield 2042 also perform well, 1080p high DLSS set to performance this time around, and 134 frames per second was the flavor of the day. Similar positive results can also be seen in racing titles like F1 2022, where at 1080p on the ultra high preset, the build delivered a strong 148 FPS on average. NVIDIA's DLSS 2 tech providing a strong boost to frame rates then, while giving us good image quality and great performance overall. If you want to buy any of the parts mentioned today, they will be linked at the affiliate links down below. Thanks for tuning into this video, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.